The most important thing from last night was not the goal song. It was the best player in the Eastern Conference starting the season as the best player in the Eastern Conference. And like, you know, Mackie sending me the post game of John Tavares talking about how he thinks that it was important with the contract that Matthews got off to that start. He thought, hey, um, this takes a little bit of the pressure off. This guy's a way more mature player, blah, 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 go on down the line. But yeah, that that one mattered. And I think it does. Man, I don't think Matthews and Marner are geared the same way mentally. I think that one guy is a little bit, like he's pretty clearly a, things don't bother me as much as maybe some other athletes in this market. Mm -hmm. Things don't seem to phase Matthews the way that other hockey players who have played in Toronto have struggled with some of the challenges that come with it. But Matthews signed a four-year extension, a four-year extension. And part of the pushback from the people who thought, Hey, it's maybe it's a good thing. He didn't sign for more than four. The, the people who thought it was actually not so bad for the Toronto Maple Leafs, their position was what if last year was not an aberration? What if, the guy who was the leading goal scorer at five on five from the second he stepped on the ice in his career, that maybe he wasn't the safest bet moving forward. And it's one game and it's a crappy Habs team and whatever, but scoring a hat trick night one to me has to matter even for the most mentally strong hockey players or athletes on the planet, just to have the confidence to start that season and feel like, okay, don't worry. I'm back. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling healthy. My shot is normal. I've got a great line. I'm going to get a ton of minutes. Like I'm me. I feel like me again. That has to felt that had to feel really, really good for Matthews last night. Mm -hmm. And like I said, to me, one of the most important things for the Leafs, if you're betting on them, if you're believing in them and you like the, their futures to be changed, their prospects to be changed. You have to believe that Austin Matthews is the best player in the conference. And last night was a pretty nice start for that. A nice start to get back to, to normal. Anyways, getting back to normal. Christopher Stieg. Two times Stanley Cup champion. Creator of the Clever app. Which again, you can download for free. Uh, pretty much becoming an invaluable tool for parents and coaches in new sports. What's up, brother? How are we doing? How excited are you to have me back on this incredible show oh you know what you saved it with incredible show because when you said how excited to have me back and you started going down i was like mm. and then you complimented me as well and i went all right we can both be great then this is okay. fine you know this is fine we can both pump each other up like i can say nice things about me and you can say nice things about you and then i think it'll balance out and and we'll just let the audience basically pick which one of us they hate the most that's uh well that was decided in 2010 when oh. they put my jerseys on for 50 percent off really fast yeah that's kind of nice though that. that's kind of nice yeah. i think you see them you you saw you see a couple floating around the city from time to time i've seen two homeless people wearing them yeah which is fine <laughs> but what can hey, you do that's that's basically charitable work that you did you get credit exactly. for that you get credit exactly. for that that's really nice i actually I think there's something to not that I don't think you actually fall in this category, but I think there is something to having the, the miss Jersey, like the, the, the Jersey that you bought where you were like, this guy, this guy's going to be a stud. Like my cousin has a Jorge Garbajosa Raptors Jersey. And it's something like, uh, like a Hey, do Turkaloo is even worse for the Raptors jerseys. I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, I, I did remove Jason Blake from this after our conversation, knowing how sick he actually was to start his Leafs career. But I remember a lot of people buying the Jason Blake, good number, right? Like it didn't work out. Um, yeah, uh, there, there've been a few like that, but there's something, there's something to, to owning those jerseys, especially if you didn't buy it on the 50% discount rack. Yeah. Well, again, when I was coming in, you thought you got Doug Gilmore and you got Doug Glatt. So again, yeah. they went, Hey, I, hey buddy, let me tell after. you something. Nobody yeah. thought you were going to be Doug Gilmore here. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I hate to break this to you, but well, you know what? I had I had a side tuck. Maybe yeah, that's why. Yeah. Okay. I was, oh, that, I was the last that. of the tuck. I was the last of the tuckers. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I I think that's partially true. Although, yeah, McDavid's had that. So yeah, he's allowed to do it. You're actually not supposed to be allowed to do that. Really? Not. I don't yeah. know that, that yeah. was that was not allowed anymore. 2013 or 2014, they told all the Tuckers no more. But yeah. again, obviously, <laughs> they yeah, what, what, like Ovechkin still does it. Yeah, of course. David still does it. Yeah. You know what? I, like I said, I, I think that what, what the Leafs get back for you? Uh, you don't, don't remember? Know, first, first and a third. That's when I got shipped out. But it was a first and a third? Yep. 
See, that's yep. see, that's nice. Getting traded for a first and a third. Like you can point to that. I see that's the thing. There's no there's no animus between Leafs fans and you. There's none. I don't I don't think there's an ounce of it, to be honest. I think you're good. I think you're uh, as a as a major No, what do you mean, yeah? What will you go to the games and people are like you sucked here? Well, no, I'm just I'm just nah. saying it it is what it is, you know. It is what it is. You yeah. move on. I don't know, man. You you had thirty five points in fifty three games here. You scored a bunch of goals and you got traded for a first and a third. I think you're all right. I think you think you're all right. Uh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Didn't uh, release nation. Yeah. You'll be fine. Uh, okay. So by the, by the way, before we start off, you listened to the show yesterday. You're a big fan of me. I appreciate that, but you sent me a critique text. So what did you take issue with that? I said yesterday. Nothing, nothing. I just okay. wanted to kind okay. of be hard on you and okay, make yeah. you better. Hard coaching. Okay. So today you brought your best. That's okay. pretty much it. All right. I appreciate that. All right. I thought that maybe there was going to be something where you went, no, 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 yeah. you're way off base on this one. Cause yeah, you have held me account. Okay. So yesterday no, you were, you were in the whole, you know, first day of Christmas or yeah. like, you're so excited yeah. and yada, yada. And then I don't even think you got to analyzing anything. Cause you're no. just telling everyone how excited you were about first day of least hockey. Can I be honest though? Do you really want me analyzing things? No, exactly. No. There you go. So you're welcome to the audience. I think I'm better setting up the potential take and then letting people like you actually analyze it. So let's start with this. Um, you were texting me last night about the leaf stylistic changes. And I, I, I think it'd be a good thing to start with is just how you see a different Leafs team this year beyond the personnel. I, th- I think the stylistic change could go back to them not fully trusting their defense core. And a lot of teams like to play like this in order to keep the pace of the game high. They like to have one pass exit. So like the first four or five passes of the game, they weren't even going D to D. It was straight quick up. And then obviously when Brody gets the, he falls on the blue line, it kind of shifted a bit of the momentum and the energy of the game. But I think it was just trying to get the puck out of the zone fast as possible. Keep it moving. That's a great way to play hockey when you get into the playoffs because it means you're spending less time in your D zone, where before it would be D to D, back to D, hold it, wait for guys to swing back. When Matthews and Marner are out on the ice and you want to get the puck in their hands and have them carry it through the neutral zone, that's fine. But when Noah Gregor's on the ice and these fourth third liners, you need the puck moving north fast. And I thought that was a good play, that they were just getting the puck, they were moving it fast, weren't trying to spend too much time in the zone. Still takes time for the D to do it. I know they went D to D quick, and that's where uh, Lilligren kind of he kind of messed up on that pass, mm-hmm. went to them, and it turned it over. But at least they're thinking that way, and it takes time to start to execute that because you have to think quicker, you have to pick options faster. But I like it. I, I like that stylistic change, and I like that going forward. If that's going to be a way they play to keep the pace of the game high rather than than the pace of the game slow, there is other things they need to do to pick up the pace of the game and we can get to that. But that piece right there, I really like. Okay. So before you get to that, how many games in then? Cause you said it takes some time before that starts to settle in. I guess this one would be a two part of then is one is, do you think this is just a way of getting guys comfortable like their new blue line, or this is something that you, you see lasting as a, a goal throughout the season. And two well, is how many yeah. games in before you start to really judge that new system change? Well, I think, again, they, they were trying to do it last year as well. I just uh-huh. I just noticed this year it wasn't as much, you know, hold the puck, wait for guys to get back, and then attack. I think this type of um, way to get used to it as a forward, first off, when the puck gets to your D, you got to jump to holes to get open. Second, you as a D-man have to have your head up, and you have to be picking options quick, whether it's up the boards, whether it's up the middle. You have to really be picking options quick. So, when, when you get to the regular season, the game is faster. The game picks up. A lot of these teams, sometimes they forecheck with two guys, so that gives you literally no time to do anything. So in order to get the puck moving fast and your brain to be clicking as fast as possible, it takes time to settle into the pace of the game. Mm. So that's why I'm saying it takes time to start to for, for you to actually calibrate what's going on on the ice. And that's why I think, those type of mistakes that you saw yesterday, maybe the Lilligren mistake, trying to make a quick play, get it going north, mm-hmm. was uh, a, a reason for that. Maybe he's just not calibrated to you know the regular season. That's going to take time, and that'll take uh, you know just getting used to it. So, what was the second piece of that question? Second piece is just like how long do you expect that calibration to take? Yeah, I, again, it always takes five, ten, fifteen games, uh-huh. whoever it may be. Uh, how much confidence you have. Some guys obviously can 
can calibrate and they can they can get the puck moving and they can understand systems faster than others some guys just need time to settle in and get used to it so that that could just you know it could be different for everyone but if they're going to play well in the playoffs if they're going to you know keep their their d zone down and their d zone you know they don't want to be hemmed in all year long they don't want to you know take the puck back a minute and do a shift and try to then re-attack again which they sometimes do and then all of a sudden the puck's in their zone and they're out there for two minutes Mm -hmm. if they don't want to take on water consistently this is a style that allows you to do it yes you could be prone to more mistakes at times but it is a style that could keep you in your d zone less it could help you out in the playoffs more and and then again there's other little things like power play they can't i love the power play the but in order to keep those secondary guys in the game, you've got to find them minutes, too, on the PP. You can't just have the PP going out there for two straight minutes every single power play. You need to get them on the ice, get them off the ice, and get other guys into the game touching the puck. That can keep the pace of the game high and keep other guys in the game as well. Because I know we talked about Max Domi not having a great game, mm-hmm. but he played 11 minutes. Last time I looked, he played 11 minutes. It was a year and a half ago, two years mm-hmm. ago. So these are things that they could do to keep the pace of the game higher and that would be a second piece that I would look to fix right away. And getting these top guys to understand, go out there for a minute. Go out there for a minute and ten, but we do need these secondary guys to get in games. You look at all the top teams over the history of time, mm-hmm. their top power play is rent generally one one ten, and then they have to get off the ice to get their other guys on because they're valuable to the game as well and getting them into the game and keeping the pace high. Yeah, so I think that part of yesterday, though, was a byproduct of their chasing the game, right? Chase, and percent and, yeah. and so you're you're leaving those guys out there a little bit longer, and some of the new faces end up getting a little less time. I, I think that, yeah, you'll you'll probably see over the course of the season it, it normalized back to the the one ten thing. Uh, just sticking with the the way that they're playing though, the way that they like, yeah, basically the quick strike, quick stretch offense. Do you think that's this is gonna? Because you love coach talk, right? And this is, I don't want to say this flies in the face of what Sheldon Keefe wanted in the past because there's been multiple iterations of what the Leafs have done and what they like to do. But yeah, this was a team that was was pretty bought into not making the mistake last year. And now it kind of feels like maybe there's the potential that they're embracing that for more of it. And, and I couldn't help but think like when I'm watching it, I wonder if the way they lost to Florida last year or watching Florida last year potentially impacted them in terms of the way that they were going to move strategically. Some of it, I feel like has to do with just the personnel they have, just knowing what their blue line is and saying, well, how are we going to get the most out of these guys? Once you bring in a guy like Klingberg and once you have the, this composition of players, this might be the way that you have to do it. But, but I did think like it was a little interesting considering a lot of us look at this blue line and say, Hey, some of these guys might not be here. Um, after the trade deadline, that this group might end up look a little differently. Do you think that, yeah, that basically this, how much of this do you think has to do with the personnel that they have on the blue line versus what they think is is the right strategy for this team overall? I think it's both. I think you got to take both into account. First off, your blue line, who's on your blue line, how strong they are, how many playmakers you actually have back there. And then secondarily, what did Florida do to them in the playoffs? If you watch all these Paul Maurice clips, it was him yelling north, north the entire time. Mm -hmm. Florida was very much like that. Get the puck, get it moving, chip it in, get to space, get the puck behind the net, create offense, make it hard on the other team. They didn't, they didn't pretty it up at all. And that's similar to what Tampa did. Just Tampa has a lot better players. So Tampa had that kind of same, bring the puck back, rag it a little earlier on hold it and then go but that had them take on a lot of water i remember us talking what three years ago the leafs were a lot like that too and then we're like man we got to get the leafs got to get the puck moving they got to get it in the zone they got to get it back to the d they got to get to the net keep it simple and then let their skill take over from there Mm -hmm. this is a this is a stylistic change that if you're watching florida if you're watching the vegas golden knights all these top teams they all do it they play north fast pittsburgh did it when they were winning their two stanley cups their D weren't going always D to D, back to D, holding it, waiting, unless their top guys are on the ice. Really, unless Crosby's on the ice and you're like, okay, we got to get Sid the puck a little bit more. We got to get him handling the puck throughout the neutral zone. If anyone else is on the ice, they need that puck moving fast and they need it getting out of their zone fast. They need less time in the D zone. And this piece, again, their decor is good. They just don't have they don't have the Vegas Golden Knights decor. The mm-hmm. Vegas Golden Knights decor does play like this, and they're a better decor overall. They just get the puck, they move it fast, they get in their forwards' hands, 
And that also allows them to gap up quickly as well, which is a big piece of their game. But that's a piece that the Leafs need to put into theirs. So I feel it's a bit of both. They need to help their D as much as possible. They need to exit and they need to start preparing for playoffs now. And that's when I'm going back to the power play and getting secondary guys confident, getting those guys into the game, the Bertuzzi's, the Domi's, these other guys that need the puck to feel good about themselves. This is something that needs to start getting instilled sooner than later. We, you know, we are talking about, yeah, they are chasing the game and doing other things, mm-hmm. but I would like to start to see that this, these type of changes take uh, shape now because by the time you get to the playoffs, you need your guys hardwired for it. Yeah. Uh, again, I think that we're, we're going to see a lot more of those guys. Um, I, I liked a lot of what I saw from a couple of the new guys. I was a little worried about some of the things we saw from one of the other guys in particular, the one that you mentioned maybe with 11 minutes, but yeah, I want to get into that in a second, but just while we're on the coaching, you know, you and I have both been pretty critical of Keith in the past, but Sounds like you like the stylistic change for this team, at least what he's trying to do from a coaching standpoint with this team. And then secondarily, what did you think about the early pull? Because that was, you know, like five minutes left in the game. I love it. You're taking a risk. You're down by two goals. You got to get your best guys on the ice. You got to take a chance. And I think they're also looking at the way the tide was turning. Mm-hmm. You know, they go out and all of a sudden they get two, you know, off a turnover, the yield alone and goal, and, and then a power play goal against. But besides that, they were really controlling the pace of the play and the game five on five. So I don't think they were worried about the puck going back into their zone unless there's a, you know, a, a risky pass and a turnover that would allow them to get a free empty net. Mm-hmm. So they like they like the pace of the play. They like the the in zone time. So that's why what must all let into the early pull and also taking a chance. You're down by two goals. You need to get a goal. I like when coaches take a risk. That is a great call on their part. I don't know whose call was it. Was it Boucher? Was it the D coach? Was it the, was it the video coach giving analysis, telling them, Hey guys, like we have a ton of zone time here. Let's get them out early. Let's do this. So it was probably mm-hmm. a collaborative pull altogether, but that's the type of risk you need to take for good teams. I remember when I was with the flames and Glenn Gullitson, he's a, he's a, he's a very good, great guy, good coach. Like he would wait for a minute to pull the goalie at times, mm. you know, and we'd be like, "Gully, we we got to get out at least two and a half minutes." Like, well, you know, we're a, we're a point out of the or we're a point out of the playoffs, two points out of the playoffs. You got to pull. We got to pull the goalie. So when you see your coach taking that risk, especially with a minute, two, three minutes left in the game, it gives a lot of energy to the players. I would say it gives mm. a lot of trust to the players. And it's a lot of risk on the coaching staff because if it doesn't go well, it, it you know, obviously you're down 6-3, but now it does go well. And now they know that they can do it in the future as well. Yeah. I will say that it was one of those things where I loved it. I loved that it worked out. And I, but there was, I think the 2019 season, maybe I'm wrong, but there was one year with the Leafs where they kept having these comebacks to get themselves out of trouble. Like they would play poorly and then they would have a moment like that. And I went, don't let this settle in as the way that you can get things done time and time again. Although I, I actually did think that they played a mostly really good hockey game, just didn't get some saves and had some really bad turnovers that put them in that position. Okay. So the new guys, right? Um, you got Sheldon Keefe gushing about Reeves, fight and the hits and the energy that he brought into the game to start. You got Gregor, who scores a goal. You got, you know, Klingberg, who was snapping it around all night. Bertuzzi, who, you know, I thought from the second period on was pretty strong. Uh, gets into the really fun scrum that I, I think people just adore here. Who who made the best first impression to you out of the new guys? Klingberg to me. Yeah. Klingberg, the way on the power play. We talked about it last year. We've talked about it the year before. Riley like when he's going really well on the power play, he's moving and walking the blue line with his feet. And when you watch Klingberg, he's creating so many scenarios for either shot pass, whatever with his feet. It's like his feet are like butter. We're going to call him butter feet from now on, but it's crazy the way that he can walk the blue line. He can create good angles to give shots, just like on the Nylander goal. He has soft hands where he's making passes to, to, Matthews, an area where maybe he wouldn't have got the puck last year. So Klingberg, to me, obviously we look back and you can see some D zone uh, issues. But I think when he's engaged in the game and he has he has the puck a lot and he's on the power play, he could be the most pivotal piece brought into this team this off season. 
Uh, a second guy that I liked was Bertuzzi. He does think the game at a high level. You saw a lot of give and goes with the top mm-hmm. guys where other, you know, that one where I think Matthews went down low, he tapped it back out, and that should have been a goal. It was a wild save. But Bertuzzi made a lot of high, high IQ plays. He did a lot of good things right. He got into the mix. I liked him a lot. And then if we're looking back to Domi, Domi, obviously, there's a couple instances where he didn't get the puck out and he just wasn't feeling it. He did have some good passes and good good attempts, could have had a couple assists possibly in some some situations. But when we're looking at Domi and we're looking at Nyes, I didn't think Nyes was very good. I didn't think Minton was good at all. Mm-hmm. But they're nervous, new game, and they're figuring each other out. But when we're looking at these guys like Domi, again, I go look at Domi's game logs. When's the last time he played 11 minutes? It's over a year and a half ago. He's mm-hmm. on a new team. He's expected to handle the puck and make plays. I've done it. I've been a player who's expected to do what Domi's done. When you play 11 minutes, it's impossible almost to be an offensive guy, to be expected to do what you need to do, and especially when you're not getting on the power play. So I think it's going to take time maybe for him, A, if that's the minute they have him at, we need to level our expectations to, okay, he may not be a half point a guy a game. Because if you're only getting 10, 15 seconds on the PP, and if you're only getting 8 to 12 minutes a night, you're not going to be a half point a guy game. You just don't get the puck enough. You don't get enough scenarios to get goal scoring chances. So I think we're going to have to level set the expectations on guys like Domi. Uh, if, if he's not going to get upwards of the 13, 14, 15 minutes and good power play time consistently. Yeah. But what he needs to do is just keep it simple. He's a great player. He's high, high IQ guy. And I think you're going to see as the season goes on, his game starts to build. There is a lot of pressure on him too. His yeah. dad's an icon here. Yeah, his right. dad just walked out with Drake. Yeah, like his dad's an icon here. There's a ton of pressure on him. He's going to do just fine. He's a great guy. He's a hard worker. He's a high IQ player. But we need to level what the expectations are of him based on what he's actually going to get from mm-hmm. Keith as the coach. So, like, just to stick with Domi for a second, because, yeah, I thought I thought he had a really tough night. And... Yeah, I thought about the pressure thing too, but this is someone who's played in Montreal, you know, and, and had success there. And and I know this is different because this is, you know, uh, they're asking you questions and you're saying, no, that's my dad's number. And you're going to have those, those you're going to have to address those type of things. There is going to be a different spotlight on you when that's the last name on the sweater. And yeah, like, all those things I, I believe are yeah, correct. This is that, way bigger than Of Montreal, course. No, no, no. Like I, I, I with, like, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. And this is his boyhood team. You know, this is all the things that he's probably ever dreamed of, and they're happening right now. I will say that – and do you know him? I don't know him. Okay. No. I, I skated with him in the summer a couple yeah. of times uh, when we trained back in the day. Like, I trained uh, – skated great guy yeah but i don't know him on a personal level no. okay he is actually cousins with a kid i coach okay first cousin. So, so i i don't know him either but i have met him a couple of times and he does seem like the kind of guy who doesn't get overly faced like i'm i'm not too worried about the market sweeping him up i think that he will eventually find his level but i think it will get harder if he continues to have games like you just said and I, like the problem i see with him Just from, again, we're one game, so everybody just chill out. But I don't see how that minute, like the minutes change all that much. Because he's clearly not going to be trusted in his own zone. And this was the book on him, like the the entire offseason. This was when he came to Toronto. People go, you know, this guy's really not trusted in his own end. And then last night, he had what I would say is like at Lilligren's is is a bad play. It's a mistake. Brody falls down. His was like the most egregious to me of all of the errors that bites them for a goal. He's not going to get D zone draws. He's not obviously getting penalty kill. He's not going to get first line power or first minute power play. And then when Minton ends up leaving, which I think is going to end up happening here, I would put a lot of money down that he doesn't play 10 games. What happens with Nyes to me is they, they might end up bumping him up into the top six. Like that thing could happen sooner rather than later. And, and so I, I guess I would be a little concerned coming off of this game. If I'm Domi saying, all right, this wasn't just a byproduct of us chasing the game. Maybe I'm getting up there into the 13-minute range, but it was kind of hard for me to think about how he's going to get a ton more than that consistently. Yeah, Honestly, I think the way the game went, first game of the season, guys getting a lot of extra power play time. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm Max Domi and I get, you know, I get home last night and, you know, and you're, you're thinking about your game, It's just think about simple plays, just simple plays early on in the game 
uh, in simple situations and then let your game build because, again, obviously the pressure of the scenario, pressure of the team, pressure for more minutes, trying to do so much. you got to build you got to build a foundation. And what that's going to do is playing, you know, just simple, chipping it off, chipping it in, getting out. That's not his full game, but he can play that game. He's a gritty little bugger. Like, he can get in there. He can make stuff happen. He can grind it out. He's tough as nails. So getting back to the simple part of his game, allowing him to build the coach's trust, that's another thing. Keith obviously has issues with these mid-level guys. Yep. Ker- Kerfoot, another guy. I know Kerfoot was on the PK, and he could do things better I was going to say, he's kind of like the inverse version. Yeah, you know, but it's that mid-level guy. It's kind of guys like me. The guys like us need to be able to paint outside the lines because we're creative, but we don't have the same leash as the top guys. Mm. And so guys like us still need that freedom in order to make plays. Now, we're not top. I'm not saying I was ever a top guy, but I was a playmaker. I was a guy that needed some freedom to make plays. Same with Max Domi. But I always noticed with the coaches, especially early on, I got to gain their trust. And you got to gain it with playing the right way, doing simple things. You got to get some money in the cookie jar, essentially. Mm -hmm. Because when the time comes for you to start making plays, you need to be able to pay the piper, essentially, in case you turn it over. Mm -hmm. So these are things that Max can do. He just just needs to play simple. I don't care if he's on the second or third line. He's a Mm -hmm. guy that can... With his, his uh, puck protection skills, with his playmaking, he can play on a third line. I would still like to see Camp move up into the third line at some point. You can protect Minton a little more on the fourth. And then you could move Nyes up. You could move guys around and kind of spread out that top nine a little bit better. But I'm not worried if he plays first, second, or third line, Domi. He's a guy that can protect a puck, but he's going to have to build the game with simple plays, get the coach's trust, and then go from there. But he is a guy that will need power play time. You mm-hmm. can't just go out there and expect to score off the rush with the last 10, 15 seconds of power play. You, it's just, it's not possible and it's not easy to get in the game. And you might not even touch the puck. Mm-hmm. So he is a guy that's going to need the puck. He's going to need to feel good about himself, but he's just going to have to start with the base level of simple plays, grind it out. It's brutal. I know it's boring, but at the, at the light at the end of the tunnel is you're going to get the coach's trust. You're going to get put into more situations. And he's a guy that I believe does love the pressure. And I love watching him play. And I hope he succeeds. I think so, too. So I, hope, I, I hope that's what happens. Yeah. And I, and I think that it will normalize. And you're right. The jitters and the, I just, I agree with you about the, the, you know, piggy bank thing where he's got to bank some equity. It was just that, that was the tough one to me is that's about as worse. That, that's about as bad of a start as you could have had with that turnover. Eventually, though, you make those plays that you're talking about and you're going to be playing with John Tavares and William Nylander on a line with, yeah, Tavares winning a lot of offensive zone draws. Like, he'll he'll get his opportunities. I just, yeah, I hope for his sake that he's able to capitalize on them quick. It's just because I, I think that when you're talking about bumping camp up to the third line and removing Minton, that, that eventually that could end up being, uh, yeah, taking... T- taking knives and and replacing him or giving him a lot of those minutes like he he's yeah. going to be in a real competition with that player the minton thing um like i thought he looked nervous and yeah, yeah. T- you know he like if we're doing the nerves thing how much are you buying in yesterday cuz to me the, the the biggest the biggest moment for him actually in the game was he tries to go in for a a four check and he tried to hit monahan and i was like oh no that's a boy trying to hit a man like that actually looked like you know, uh, you ever, you ever play the teachers in a sport, you know, like when you're in, it's like, that felt like that moment to me a little bit where I went, Oh, actually maybe, maybe still WHL. Yeah. He's, you know, especially at the start of the game with him and Nyes, there was a lot of mix ups in the D zone. Nyes would be down low. Minton would be down low. He wasn't reading. And that just tells me it's a kid who's nervous in his first game. Those, those nerves settle out. Once you start to again, calibrate into NHL hockey, he could play. He very well could play. I'm not saying he's not ready at all. It's just, is this the right situation right now? You're going to find out over the next five, six games where he truly is at. Mm -hmm. Um, But those reads are reads that you need to make right 100% of the time in the NHL. And they're lucky that they weren't getting basically scored against on those shifts. You have double coverage of Nyes and Minton down low. All of a sudden the puck's out at the top and then the guy on the weak side D is getting free shots. And it was happening consistently because of these guys not making reads mm. because A, is the game a little too fast right now for them? I don't know. Not for Nyes, 
But that's where Nyes is going to have to make better, you know, hockey IQ decisions. But is it a little too much for Minton to make in reads right now? Or is it because he's nervous? Those are things you're going to find out. He is a high IQ kid, Minton. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that plays the game the right way. And he's going to be a great NHLer for a long time. But those are things, if you're looking to have a Stanley Cup team, a Stanley Cup winning team, you can't have guys ever making a wrong read like that consistently. Because if you're going into playoffs and you're having guys that can't, you know, they can't break down the game mentally on the ice quickly and, and understand switches and areas and what to do, you're going to get torched against the best teams in the league, not against the Montreal Canadiens right now. So You know what, though? That makes me feel better, though, because I think he is a smart kid. He is yeah. mature. That's basically been, yeah, like that was even his pre-draft stuff, right? So I would hope that the process there is that the coaches are sitting him down with stuff like that and going, here's this like error. Here's how we can correct this. And that, yeah, that's and something that can turn around pretty quickly over the course of the first couple of games. Yeah, I agree. And again, was it nerves or was it, is the game just a little too quick right now? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Those are things we're going to find out over the next nine games. How important was it for Matthews to have that start after a new contract? Even that, for was, that was sick. He is absolutely disgusting to watch. When he's when his game is on, there is almost nothing like it besides Connor McDavid. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? There's a couple other guys that can get to that level. But even when it was it overtime, he's at the end of his shift and he's yeah, that was you know, amazing. He was on the ice for well over a minute and a half. Yeah, I was and like, he he's just on two minutes. Yeah. He wanted the four. He wanted the opening day Matthews four. Um, I. I can't remember the guys in Vancouver have a hilarious name for it. I think they call it like the dick trick or something. Cause it's like the Thornton, you know, where he talked about, Hey, if I scored four, I'd be, you know, taking it out yeah. and waving it around. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's, I, I think he wanted that bad. I think he basically wanted to have that because if he has it twice, you know, two opening games with four, that becomes like monikered the Matthews. It's wild. It's wild. The fact that, you know, how, how was it? 12 opening night goals now. They said they reported that he has most in Leafs history yeah. by like four or five. Um, but if you're looking back to all those goals, let's just talk about just his confidence and his patience and what he did. That third goal, when he got hit back door, most guys just slam that into the goalie. I, every guy slams that in the goalie. He holds it and drags it around the guy with you know however much time remaining on the clock, and he and he's still a minute left on the clock, and he slept and he stuffs it home. Those plays are are not worked on those are you are touched by god in order to do those things mm -hmm. and it is unbelievable watching him especially in a game like that he loves the pressure and remember last year we said there's something off about him at the start of the season was it last year or the year before yeah. where, where when he celebrated it just didn't feel like it didn't feel like he was fully there maybe it was a contract maybe there was issues with that who knows but when he scored, it was like when he was screaming, the roof was going to come off. Yeah. And when he does that, that type of energy bleeds to the entire team, and they feel that energy too because he wants it that much. And that means, well, oh, maybe I should want it that much as well. So when he scored those goals, and you could you could hear like you could hear him screaming with you where I am right now, mm -hmm. it was unbelievable to see that that energy. You know, it gets uh, it goes throughout the entire team, through throughout the entire building. And that's how those and that's how those games are built. Man, I think you're bang on. To me, so much of professional sports and watching great teams is how much do they either have that like complete group identity or take on the personality of the best player and and fall in line, right? And and this has been the thing for the Leafs that I keep waiting for, and what pisses me off about some of the playoff passivity and just like how he struggled in the playoffs is that's what they need. That's what they need for the deep emotion. run is for him to emotion. just, yes, him to be, he jumped in a scrum yesterday. I've never, se it. never seen yeah. that with Matthews before he got criticized. It was like, I think it was Mike Rupp killed him last year when he did the turn away from the guy and skate away and smile. And, but I, I kind of understood what Rupp was saying. Like you, you, I don't want Matthews fighting, but I, I like having the fact that he feels like he's in the mix and I love the emotion after the goals and the way that, you know, he resonates with the crowd. And, and I feel like if he can carry that energy and that swagger into big games that everybody else is going to fall in line and that the rest of the team is going to play with a ton of confidence. And like, that's the true biggest key to unlocking them for a deep playoff run.
it, it all comes back to emotion. Yeah. How you're connecting to the game. I know on all our best teams, when guys scored, when, when the whole bench is screaming and guys are in each other's face and you would jump in for anyone, just like Matthews did, just like everyone did on that Bertuzzi play, still a terrible call. I don't get it. But when those things happen, it brings teams together. The emotion rises. Everything about the team becomes tighter. The, the, the community becomes tighter. Everything falls in line perfectly when you can get emotionally connected and when you emotionally, you, you, you uh, what's the word, protrude, outward, outward, yeah. you outwardly show how much it means to you. Exude. 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 That's a great word. I'm mm-hmm. going to use it more. That's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, you can. It's, uh, I was like, no, it's not right, but it's kind of what right. Is but it's, what is What is I don't even know. Patrude. 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 Yeah, you do. You should probably go to school. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I didn't go in high school. Yeah, but, I, but. Shocker. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with you, man. I, and I think that nobody does that for this team more than he does. And I, uh, I'm excited to see. Uh, I'm just glad that this isn't a story to start the year. Like, I, there's nothing worse than the really good player that starts off slow and you have to start to have the takes and you know that it's going to normalize, but it's hard to talk about them critically. Anyway, uh, I'm glad it's out of off our plate, but you know who that you know, the goal you're talking about. I thought, yeah, he's one of the only guys on the planet that can, that's going to score that goal that way. Like you mentioned McDavid doing that, wow. but yeah, but you know, who's going to score that goal too? Yeah. Bedard. Like, yeah. so, yeah. so did you watch the first game of the season? Yep. Yeah, I watched. I watched a little bit of the highlights from last okay. night too. It wasn't on TV here. No. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see any of last night. I just saw the highlights too. And so I, I've, I've I referenced this on yesterday's show, but there was a moment in the second period where he's up high and he snaps this low wrister, and it gets to the net, and it's a good save by the goalie. And I'm thinking, holy crap, that thing was just lightning quick. He just he Fair got point. it off of his stick, and I went, oh, I, that's not like a normal shot. And I felt like it, it deserved a little bit more attention in the moment of going like, Hey, Hey, everybody, like, this is what makes this kid special. This is the thing that is going to result in, you know, the 40 plus goal seasons that he's going to have in the NHL. Like he was at 29 and a half this year. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I bet that over pretty heavily. Um, I think even if he doesn't hit it, he's going to be in range there, but you, you know, you, you had your biggest years in Chicago and I, I did want to ask you, how big you think it is that Chicago is relevant again, having this kid. Well, let's talk about this quickly. I can't even get tickets from Chicago or down to the room. Okay. There you go on Monday. So let's, I'm going to complain about Chicago a little yeah, bit. Okay. Um, that but, is, yeah, you won two cups. Yeah. I can't even get tickets or down to the room, but anyways, wow. Um, let's, let's talk about the Chicago being relevant is massive. This market is massive for the league to grow for people to have eyeballs on teams and to have one of the best players on the planet play there, mm-hmm. it, it is very big. When you're watching them play, you're talking about those those wristers and snappers. Even watch the behind the back pass he throws before his goal. Mm-hmm. Like he just gets the puck, throws yeah, around the back pass, gets it back on a give and go, shoots it on net, and then goes for a wraparound. Plays like that again. Only certain players in the world can make them well a they're allowed to make them and he's one of them because he makes them at a high clip so 90 percent plus clip and that's why he's allowed to try and attempt and do and make and when he takes that wrister as well he's pulling it in so tight to his feet and with the new rules with the slashing rule in 2018 prior what a guy would do is just slash his stick to throw his stick off a little bit. But when they took out the slashing rule in 2018 going into the 19 season, where basically you can't slash the shaft of the stick anymore, it's allowed these shooters to get the puck off so clean. Now, you watch that. Was it Graves was checking them in the previous game against Pittsburgh? He was rushing down the ice. And Graves can only go stick on puck where in the, in the past, 2018 prior, he just keeps smacking his stick, right? So puts it in a real hard position to shoot. Graves has to try to go stick on puck, and he pulls that puck all the way into his feet, and he almost burns Jari far side. It was a wild shot. The fact that he even got that off at that speed with that much uh, force was wild. So a guy like that being this relevant in one of the biggest markets in the world for hockey is huge. I'm happy the fans of Chicago get to see him. They are to me that will always have a, a close place in my heart. I have such good relationships with the people of Chicago and the fans. We've had many amazing memories and I'm happy that a player like that ended up there rather than Phoenix or Anaheim. Oh dude, there's nothing 
I think about it all the time. It could have been so bad. I've thought if he about ended up it. In Phoenix, it oh, would be so bad. If he was in that sweat or San Jose or oh. Anaheim at the ten thirty starts, and so all bad. you ever got was the highlights and just yeah. losing. Oh, I so I said bad. this all last season, and people were dunking on me, going, "It's good for the game if he's out there. He's ca- help grow good. the game." I was like, "It would have been the worst thing possible." I if they told me today that the NHL rigged it. And they went through and they, they should have rigged it. Yeah, I'd that's what I'm saying. I, I agree. I would have said good job by them. Finally, you know, Bettman did something that I unequivocally agree with. You know, uh-huh. I would have I would have supported it. I wouldn't have criticized it. I would have gone that if anything, the NHL should do this more. They should just open it up and just say, if there's generational talents, <laughs> you know, we're getting guys in here that we know are can't miss. We're never Did putting them in Anaheim. It like it went to Anaheim. Yeah, no, that's that's what I'm saying. Thank God. Thank God Anaheim has been on the outside of a couple of these. And and I hope that they stay out of it till the day they fold that franchise. Like, you know, yeah. like I may they may Anaheim never get a great player again. Like I'm sorry. Even when they I had good so. teams. Zegris. No. Like you can't watch Zegris play. Yeah, I don't know if he's a great player, but yeah. No, I I, I think he's a good player, but everyone yeah. always talks about these goals sure. he does and everything. Well, I'm not. No, he's per- to see, see he's perfect for Anaheim because it's like just give me the one highlight, you know, once a, a, a night, and then don't show me the rest of the game. And people yeah. go, give him the cover of the video game. I'm like, I guess, <laughs> like, yeah. I guess yeah. so. Uh, if, you, if you say so, he's supposed to be there. All right, fine. But yeah, I think overall, he's he's probably benefiting from being there. I'm trying to think about, you know how high up the, the Blackhawks tree you have to be to get tickets to this game now. Cause it is Bedard. It's against the Leafs. Like, well, don't do you, you think, know, like, you know who I had to go to Sharp? Leafs alumni. God bless the Leafs alumni. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all for getting me tickets. Cause okay. I can't even get tickets through the Hawks yeah. or down to the room. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right. So good. The job that you got them through Leafs. Alumni. How high up? You gotta be, you gotta have three cups and, and a yeah. Hall of Fame status to get That's to this That's what I was saying. Here. I was I'm like, not kidding. No, I'm saying, yeah, like Patrick Sharp, you could have asked him. I feel like he could have, like he's on, he's the bubble guy, right? Like, he's the, he might not even get in. That's what I was going to say. Shaw, Shaw, no shot. You know, no, he's, Shaw's not getting in. That's what no I'm chance. saying. <laughs> he's not getting in. But yeah, I think you could have got it if, it, I think maybe Sharp, he still works with the team. Like he has to have juice for two. You know, this is why this is why I used to hang out with Kane and Taze because yeah, no, I used yeah. to get into the good <laughs> the good restaurants, and I can't even call them up right now yeah. to get me into this game. Yeah, no, that's a tough one. That's a tough. One. At least you got into the Leafs alumni. That's going to be a one hell of a game. Uh, Christopher Steig again. Oh wait, before you go, plug the Clever app. Clever app, yeah. So again, it's an app that helps streamline video sharing and video coaching for athletes, parents, and coaches. It's a free download on the store. We also just launched Clever Pro. gives you unlimited storage and unlimited ability to create coaching clips. And, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool app. we got nine different sports on it, fitness. And it's just about, again, trying to streamline video sharing, video coaching for everyone out there. So please check it out, klevr.ai. Thanks, buddy. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. See you, pal. Uh, there goes Chris Fristig, two-time Stanley Cup champ, and, again, creator of the Clever app, which you can go get for free. And, and I do highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly reviewed app.